by Peter Behrman on suicide in adolescent girls. Um, he looked at girls who had best friends, and he wanted to know what happens when those best friends are not also friends with one another. So you're friends with Susie, you're friends with Jane, but Susie and mm -hmm. Jane aren't friends with one another. If they're friends together, everything's great. If they're not friends, it increases the likelihood that you'll commit suicide. Um, and the reason why is because you have to manage these relationships. If you know that the two of them aren't friends, then now you have to worry about what Susie will think when you do something with Jane or vice versa. And so there are lots of ways that the, the structure of the network has an impact on you directly, regardless of what flows across the, the, the ties. Mm -hmm. And so those two things, those two rules really apply to, to the, the shape of networks. Um, the other three rules are about what flows across networks. Um, the third rule is something we've known for a long time. Our friends and family members affect us. You know, other people that we're connected to that directly have an impact on us. Um, and, you know, there are uh, some social scientists that are so committed to this, you know, radical individualism that, that I think they're even skeptical about this point, that, you know, you could be influenced by, by somebody else. But I, I think that there's been a lot of good work done in the last, you know, a few decades or so that really show that, that there is a direct effect, that, that um, just for example, when we randomly assign a depressed roommate um, to live with you, then you're more likely to become depressed yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we have these direct connections that we're all, all already very aware of because we can observe them in our own life. But the fourth rule is that our friends, friends, friends affect us, right? And, and so the, the intuition here is that if I influence my friend and if my friend influences their friend whom I don't know, then I can indirectly influence my friend's friend like a, through a series of, 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 of interactions, like dominoes falling one by one. And I think that's what's really captured the imagination of people who have been, been you know, reading the, the research that we've been producing, is that for the first time, we have this fantastic data, uh, this fantastic pictures of the whole network, where we're mm -hmm. able to see how we're all connected, you know, like, like other social species, in, in the form of a, a human superorganism. We may influence people that we're directly connected to that we can see within our social horizon, but we also influence people beyond our social horizon. And in fact, one of the, the central themes of the book is that we, a lot of evidence suggests that we influence people up to three degrees of separation to your friend's friend's friend. And so I think, you know, everyone has heard of six degrees of separation. You know, mm -hmm. um, Stanley Milgram, uh, you know, he did a, the great experiment where, where yeah. he estimated that we're all connected by six handshakes, and then that was turned into the Kevin Bacon game, right, which everyone loves to play. Mm -hmm. but, but if you influence people at three degrees of separation, it's sort of like you're reaching halfway to the whole global network. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so this is what we explore. It's not just you know, obesity. It's not just uh, happiness. It's, it's lots of different things. And we also you know, talk about some great stuff that, that other researchers have done that, that's consistent with this idea that we affect people up to three degrees of separation. And then the last thing is that the, the, the whole is great. It's, it's that this idea that, that these complex interactions end up creating emergent phenomena that you couldn't explain just by looking at the individual parts. Um, and so this is very much in keeping with the move towards uh, complexity studies that's happened in, in the last 10 or 20 years, where what we're really trying to understand is, you know, how does each neuron firing become thought? You know, how does each star, you know, flying through the universe become a galaxy? And how does each human being interacting with other human beings in these beautiful social networks, um, how do we organize ourselves to achieve things that we couldn't possibly dream of on our own? Well, that was, that was a terrific rundown. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, let me explore this, uh, the idea that uh, there are, are sort of three degrees of influence uh, a little bit, uh, because I found that interesting. So the idea was, you know, so I think everybody, uh, other than some um, strange economists, uh, think <laughs> that, you know, like, except that, you know, like, our family and our, and our, and our closest friends, people we have, uh, you know, personal face-to-face -face interactions with, uh, influence us, um, and, but you show uh, that you know uh, it ripples out further than that. Um, but it dies at about the third remove. Uh, so you know, I, I can affect my friend. My friend can affect uh, their friend, and that friend can affect another friend. You know, with something that originated in me. But then it stops there. Why? Why does it stop there? Why doesn't it ripple out? Uh, further, so halfway into the network, uh, if 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 we are really 
connected to everybody by six degrees, you know, halfway through the population is a, it's a long way. Um, well, it's, not, it's still not going to be halfway, but uh, uh, why does it stop at three? Right, so we have um, three different ideas for this. Um, and, um, the first one is that um, there's this intrinsic decay. And so your influence is going to be reduced as it passes from person to person because of signal loss. And so if you think about the kids' game of telephone, for example, where you have the kids lined up and you whisper in one of their ear, and then that person whispers in the next kid's ear, and so on, um, trying to pass a message from person to person, the message at the other end of the line is hardly ever the same thing as, as what you whispered in, in you know, the, the first person's ear. And so it might just degrade over time this message. Um, you know, just for example, um, you might really try to influence one of your, your friends to start exercising. Right? And maybe you have a really effective way to do that. And when your friend tries to do the same thing with their friend, they kind of lose some of the main ideas whenever it's being passed from person to person to person. Um, another possible idea is that our friends and family members are, are, are changing all the time. Now, those direct connections don't change very often. So for example, in, in the Premium Heart Study, what we find is that people change best friends uh, at a rate of about 1% per year. So over the course of the 32-year study, um, about one-third of the people change their friends. But what that means is that your friends of friends are changing at about double that rate, or the, the, it's actually even more than that, and your friends of friends of friends are changing even faster because any mm -hmm. one of those ties can be cut. And so out of four degrees of separation, from year to year, this might be a completely different set of people because of, of all the, the instability that's going on in the network. But the thing that we look at the most in the book is this third idea, which is this idea that, that social networks are in our nature and that we evolved over the last hundreds of thousands of years to live in these small human groups where we would not have been connected to anybody by more than three degrees of separation. And so we talk about um, work by Robin Dunbar, an anthropologist, um, where he, uh, you know, this anthropologist has, has made an effective case um, for this idea that the natural human group size is about 150 people. Um, and if you, if you look at the average number of close friends that people have, which is about five or six, um, then what that means is that in any one of these groups of 150 people, um, you're going to have five times five times five, about 125 friends of friends of friends. And so if we lived in these groups over time and you had some kind of selection pressure um, so that, for example, groups that were able to coordinate action were able to survive better than other groups and individuals living in those groups were, were themselves better off, um, then you can imagine natural selection acting on us to, to give us bigger brains, which is consistent with what a lot of neuroscientists are arguing, the social intelligence hypothesis, in order to manage all these relationships. But you wouldn't have needed to ma manage out to that fourth degree of separation be because um, we didn't tend to live in groups that were any larger than that. Uh, I was saying, you're a great explainer, James. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how, how, how far you, how much you cover. Uh, well, let, let's. Uh, I would like to get back to the uh, some, some of the uh, evolutionary stories uh, in a little bit about uh, you know why uh, we uh, you know, would be adapted to uh, act with the networks in a way that we do. Uh, your chapter seven is kind of the my I think the juiciest chapter in your book. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about some of these specific cases of of. Uh, of contagion through networks. Uh, in particular, let's talk a little bit about uh, happiness, since I, I've done a, a, a good deal of work on uh, happiness research. Uh, in the book, you talk about uh, a result that you found that uh, happiness is kind of contagious. I think I saw this in the news. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah happiness is contagious. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about uh, uh, that study and uh, you know what it. Uh, shows us about the dynamics of networks. Sure. So this, again, comes from the Framingham Heart Study uh, that Nicholas Christakis and I um, were fortunate enough to stumble on this social network information that they had been keeping for years, not for the purpose of studying uh, social networks, but just to keep people coming back. Right. So, so mm -hmm. maybe they lose contact with you and they need to find out where you are. Um, and if they know who your friend is and your coworker is, they're going to be able to call on those guys and figure out where you are and, and get you to come back in the study for the, for the next round. Um, and so, so the network stuff was completely incidental? It was completely incidental. It was. It oh, was. It, this is, you know, one of my favorite stories. Is is that um, when Nicholas and I first met, um, we we knew that what we needed was a really good data source, and we thought we were going to have to create it from scratch. And we did some back of the envelope calculations, and we figured out we needed twenty five million dollars. And so, so we went to the NIH and we said, "Can we have twenty five million dollars, please?"